Hello everyone and welcome to Blogging Theology. Today I'm delighted to talk again to Dr. Shuaib Ahmed Malik. You're most welcome, sir. Thank you very much, Paul, for having me again. Good to see you again. For those who don't know, uh, Shuaib is an assistant professor in the College of Natural and Health Sciences at Zayed University, Dubai, UAE, where he is at the moment, where he has been teaching for seven years. In addition to his PhD in chemical engineering, Dr. Malik is currently completing his second PhD in theology at the University of St. Mary's here in London. He's the author of Islam and Il Evolution, Al-Ghazali and the Modern Evolutionary Paradigm. And uh, here is my copy of this book. There we go. Lovely cover. Do get this book. It uh, addresses all those questions you ever want to ask about Islam and evolution with great scholarly clarity. And it's a very readable book. So whether or not you agree with his conclusions, uh, the discussion is certainly worth reading about in that volume. Get it online. Um, he is currently, um, this was chosen, by the way, as the best academic book in the science or science and religion category by the International Society for Science and Religion last year, 2022. He's currently writing a, a textbook and a micrograph on the pedagogy of Islam and evolution for the petitious uh, publisher Rutledge and has several other edited volumes and special issues underway. Now, the idea that a 12th century Islamic scholar by the name of Al-Ghazali, who died in 1111, was personally responsible for the decline of science and reason in the Muslim world is popular in certain atheist circles and others as well. Al-Ghazali alone apparently doomed the Muslim world by insulting the role of reason, shunning philosophy and the natural sciences from the Muslim world and declared his view to be Islamic orthodoxy. It's this grossly mistaken understanding that appears in some polemics of modern atheists and others. For example, a very well-known science popularizer by the name of Neil uh, deGrasse Tyson, an American, a self-proclaimed agnostic, claimed in two lectures that Al-Ghazali was the source of the decline, claiming that Al-Ghazali taught, and I quote, mathematics is the work of the devil. And that's on in a YouTube video you can see online. Tyson and certain prominent atheists seem unaware of the vast amount of scholarship that has gone into Al-Ghazali in the past 50 years, showing this to be complete myth. So um, would you like to introduce us to the subject, Shoaib? Yeah. Thank you very much, Paul, uh, for that introduction. So, um, Salaam alaikum, everyone. Hello to everyone who's watching. Um, uh, my intention today is to go over a, uh, uh, a brief overview of a chapter that I wrote a couple of years ago. And so I have a presentation slide that I'd like to share with you. Uh, and here it is. Yeah, so this is an image I generated through uh, mid-journey. Uh, I've been playing uh, around with that software. Is there no limit to your talent, sir? I mean, you know, <laughs> the scientist, the elogian, artist, uh, amazing. No, so I, when I was younger, I used to do um, graphic design, and I, and, I, and, I, and I used to design posters, and this really reinvigorated my interest, and there's a lot you can do now with mid-journey, so I, wow, I, you yeah. know, I plugged in a few prompts, and I really, really love this poster, so I wanted to use it for this presentation. Very vivid. Mm, yeah. yeah. So the, 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 the contention that, uh, that seems to come out in many different circles, many different circles, is Ghazali condemned philosophy, condemned reason, condemned logic, condemned science, and that eventually led to the decline of the Muslim world. Mm. Um, and I wanted to really address this and tackle this. I was given the opportunity to do so with the Cambridge Companion to the History of uh, Atheism, which is a, a two-volume set that was edited by Stephen Bullivan and Michael Ruse. They invited me to write a chapter about this, which I um, very uh, uh, you know, happily did. And you can find this uh, online, and we'll hopefully have the link even uh, down below the description. Yeah, I will, we'll leave the link. I, I read the article, it's very readable, and a, a very concise and thorough um, um, you know, a bit of research into this whole issue, so I do recommend it. Yeah, thanks, Paul. So, so it's not that this has not been tackled before. It has many, you know, prominent philosophers, many prominent historians of Islamic intellectual history 
have mentioned this in detail that you know Ghazali could not have ca caused the decline of the Muslim world because of X Y Z reasons. What are those X Y Z reasons? Is something we'll look at today. Uh, but unfortunately, this is a myth that's perpetuated till today uh, by many ex-Muslim atheists who will you know review shortly, as well as famous individuals like Neil deGrasse Tyson. Unfortunately, I have seen this even uh, amongst certain Muslims and circles of Muslims, which yeah. is surprising. It's so entrenched now that even Muslims actually believe that Ghazali is anti-philosophical or anti-science, which is far, far from the case. And I hope to, you know, illustrate that through this uh, brief presentation based on my chapter. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting you should say, I, I was speaking to um, a certain um, Muslim philosopher at Oxford University just about 15 minutes ago about this. Uh, and he said exactly that in his early years, he thought Al-Ghazali uh, was responsible uh, for this decline. He now, he now knows better. Um, but uh, you know, this is something that one has to kind of become aware of and, and, and learn the truth about um, because of the misrepresentation that is quite common. Yeah, just to add to that, so in my own personal experience, when I when I was learning about Islam, I and I don't know what how I was informed about this either, if it was implicit or explicit. But I initially had this assumption that you know Muslim scholars, you know, they're like outdated thinkers. We now mm. need to look into Western scholarship. I had that mode of thinking before as well, mm -hmm. and uh, only when I started reading up about Ghazali, I was I just fell in love with him, and I felt like wow, this individual is so misrepresented. Mm. Um, in many circles. And so um, this comes to the, the two main points that I, I articulate in my work. So what I, there's, there's two main ideas that are very interconnected. One is what I refer to as the banishment thesis, that Ghazali censured the natural sciences and philosophy. That is, he had such negative views about these disciplines, and therefore it led to what we refer to as the decline thesis, that mm. Muslim world eventually lost its touch, you know, it's, it's, you know, heyday of the golden age of Islam, and as a result, it's now in the slumbers and has nothing to uh, contribute in the fields of philosophy and the natural sciences. Now, I am specifically going to be looking at the banishment thesis in the sense that I am going to uh, try and convince the reader and the, the viewer that Ghazali never had such views of the natural science and philosophy. And in, mm. you know, by logical entailment, if you prove that, then it automatically gets linked to the decline thesis in that he could not have been a cause for the decline of the Muslim world. And what oh, is the decline and what, and what, is, yeah, what's it, what are the causes of that decline is, yeah, a, separate, we'll it, is a separate question altogether. Yeah. But at the very least, what I want to show is that it, whatever is, you know, in the area of inquiry for that second question, Ghazali did not play an active role into that. Yeah. Now, this is not to say that Ghazali did not have interlocutors that disagreed with him. Naturally, there were some contentions. The most obvious one is Ibn Rushd, uh, Averroes. Ibn Rushd uh, wrote a very famous text, Tahafat al-Tahafat, right? Um, Incoherence of the Incoherence, where he mm. tries to refute you know, certain ideas of Ghazali. But this mm. was done at the philosophical level and not at the attribution that Ghazali caused the decline of the Muslim world. As I'll come to show, this is a very modern narrative that's come to the fore. Now, how is Ghazali viewed today? And, and there are two groups that I want to focus on. First um, are ex-Muslim atheists. So these are three books by three different ex-Muslim atheists. The one on the left, so this is, this is a very new cover. His first edition looked very different, but this is by Ibn Warraq. So he's, I would say, one of the first gen ex-Muslim atheists. He became very popular in the 1980s. Uh, and this is actually, uh, kind of a Muslim version of Burton Russell's "Why I Am Not a Christian," uh, oh, yes, which is yeah. a pen name. Yeah. And so that's not his real name, Ibn Warak. That's a, a, yeah, yeah, a, that's a pen name as well. Yeah, that's a pen name. Yeah. And, and apparently, he did that because he wanted to. He he learned from the Rushdie affair to not be explicit and not reveal his identity. Apparently, that's what I read about about the name. But yeah, then we have Tanner Edis, who is a theoretical physicist, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and he wrote this book called An Illusion of Harmony. And then Ayan Hirsi Ali in 2015, she published Heretic, Why Islam Needs a Reformation Now. And so these books span 20 years. And I'm going to share some excerpts from these three books. Ibn Warak. I was just saying, I, I saw that. Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, I just saw uh, Hershey Ali. I, I saw her on um, Douglas Murray was interviewing her just a couple of days ago. Uh, she's getting a lot of airtime now, um, certainly using her real name. Uh, so she's very much involved still in anti-Islamic 
uh, polemics. Yeah, yeah, she is. Yeah. So uh, just uh, you know, giving you some excerpts from the books, we have Ibn Raq. He says that Al Ghazali tells us that certain of the natural sciences are contrary to the law and religion, and tells us to abstain from free thought and accept the conclusion of the prophets. Mm. Right. Tanner Addis says, many defenders of reason in Islam argued that after Al-Ghazali rejuvenated Sunni orthodoxy, Muslim intellectual life became more rigid. The mainstream ulama, Muslim theologians, had always been cool toward the foreign sciences such as philosophy and mathematics, and Al-Ghazali's condemnation of them carried the day. And finally, Hirsi said, and this is, this is, a, this is a very, very, I'd say, a hard you know, stance, Al-Ghazali detested the ancient Greek philosophers. He regarded human reason as a cancer upon Islam. I so must say, that, that, that I, I, I'm just, when I read that, it's the most astonishingly astonished piece of garbage I've ever read. Um, anyway, yeah, yeah. That last, uh, one, I mean, that last sentence you just read. Yeah, it's, it's a very strong assertion, very strong assertion. Mm. Uh, and, and, I'll, and I hope to show that what, what she's saying here is so far removed from the truth. Yeah. And we also have, um, you know, famous scientists, uh, you know, Paul, you mentioned uh, Neil deGrasse. We've got Steven, you know, Weinberg. He's a, a Nobel Prize winner, if I'm not mistaken. And he, yeah. he, he says that he pointed out that Ghazali rejected science and how the Muslim world went through a decline. Tyson, as you said, you know, he, he said that Ghazali thought that manipulation numbers or mathematics is the work of the devil. And so all these kinds of, you know, words are thrown around about Ghazali and how he is the most significant cause for the anti-philosophical, anti-scientific attitude that Muslims represent today, mm. Mm. and so this is a this is a this is a huge thing, and it's carried forward by big big names in the current landscape. Uh, and the, one of the reason uh, one of the reasons why I wanted to have a dedicated presentation on this is because just recently uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson's video started circulating again, and yes. I thought you know it's, it's it's time that you know we kind of address this point. Um, yeah, I, I, I think, I think your, your desire, your, your uh, wish to have this discussed now is very timely. Um, that there's quite a bit going on in social media, on Twitter even, and, and uh, even some atheists are pushing back against this narrative, saying it's just complete rubbish. It's not based on any facts, any reading of Al-Ghazali. So it's a very timely intervention, I think, by yourself. No, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. So uh, moving into the, uh, the next part of the presentation. So I wanted to highlight two key things here that come out you know, of, of these kinds of quotes. One mm -hmm. is that Ghazali is responsible or, or you know, he, he firmly denied the natural sciences you know, and, and philosophy. And the reason why he did this is because he had a quote unquote spiritual turn in his life. And once he had that spiritual turn, he just rejected everything altogether. And I hope to show that that's definitely not the case. Um, this uh, idea that Ghazali, you know, both of these ideas can be traced back to oriental narratives. Mm. Uh, and there's a very, very famous figure who I think initiated this kind of thinking. He's not the first one. You can find many others like him. But Ernst yeah. Renner is just one of the most well-known figures uh, that I want to bounce off of. So Ernst Renner was a French scholar, and he was fascinated by Ibn Rushd Averroes. And he thought Ibn Rushd was like the carrier of the Western philosophical discourse, namely Aristotle and Plato. But the Muslim world rejected Averroes and uh, you know, followed the track of Ghazali. This led the Muslim world to being very anti-philosophical, anti-scientific, which crystallized the decline thesis. Now, this was in the heyday of Orientalism. And you know, we've had several successive works after that that you know, show the shortcomings of Orientalism, namely the book by Edward Said, uh, the book that yeah, I, I, I do. I do. And this is a seminal work. It's a huge influential. I do recommend you read it. Um, the, uh, he was a professor of English literature at Columbia. So he actually writes beautiful English. Uh, often, often his prose is, is worth is just sheer pleasure to read, to be honest. But no, there's a serious academic purpose, which is uh, his uh, understanding of Orientalism uh, and his debunking of it, basically, and exposing of how... Uh, infused the Western tradition, intellectual tradition has been with these tropes about the Orient and Arabs and Muslims. Um, so I do recommend this book that you've got the picture of on the right there. Yeah, and it, part of the Oriental narrative is to show the superiority of the West and the inferiority of the Middle East and the Muslim world. So Muslims had nothing intellectual to offer. Uh, Muslims have a very barbaric civilization and other tropes to that effect. 
Yeah. Um, and it's good to see that in you know in the scholarship, particularly after uh, Edward Said's book, there has been a lot of pushback against this, even in the in the areas of historical scholarship, which show that Muslims actually did a lot of scientific activities even way after Ghazali, completely mm -hmm. undermining the thesis that there ever was such a thing called scientific decline in the Muslim world. But that's a different conversation uh, altogether. Mm -hmm. So the two works that are relevant here are mm -hmm. the first one is uh, you know the incoherence of the philosophers, the half of the yeah, philosophers. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, that's the one. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, that's the one. I, I just so, want to. I, I just want to um, just take, just share this to very because uh, th this is a classic work, um, and I this is the standard English translation. It's a big book, a brick of a book. Um, but I if you want to really get to grips with um, uh, the Islamic tradition, classical tradition, this is a must book to add to your library. Uh, if you can, uh, but you can certainly buy it easily online. Uh, got my copy, so I just want to highlight the importance of perhaps getting uh, acquainted with this text, which would be a key work I know in your presentation. So, thank you. So, this is a book in which Ghazali um, critiques twenty different propositions um, that you know that uh, Ibn Sina espoused, and this was a, one of the greatest, um, uh, I would say, philosophical activities in Ghazali's period, in the sense that it really showed that there was very intense debate and dialogue of very, very key ideas in the Islamic um, uh, mind space at the time. There's another work of Ghazali that's relevant to us, and this is uh, Al-Munqa bin Dalal, which is his deliverance from error. And this is like an autobiography where, we, where he walks through his experiences uh, and even, you know, the he talks about his spiritual turn. But uh, despite having the spiritual turn, he still maintains his respect and the validity of the natural sciences, logic and philosophy, as we'll come to see. So that's why these two books are important. And I mentioned these even in the chapter uh, because uh, I wanted to make it clear that even after his quote unquote spiritual turn, the, these sciences were never removed uh, from Ghazali's Ghaz scope of validity as what yeah. counted as beneficial sciences for yeah. the Muslim world. So now it's important to understand that when we use the word philosophy today, it doesn't carry the same meaning as it uh, did once before. Yeah. Previously, when we when we use the word philosophy, um, we're mostly relying on on the idea that we're talking about the works of Aristotle, and these were manifested and expressed best through the Muslim philosophers at the time, namely Ibn Sina, Al Farabi, and Kindi, those individuals, and mm. so. Within that framework, philosophy had six main branches, right? It's very different to what it is today. Philosophy is now very broad. We have philosophy of mind, philosophy of science, philosophy of religion. These but, divisions didn't but, quite exist. But, but we still have the term natural philosophy or the natural philosophers, which yeah. equates roughly to modern science in a way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But it also included what we now call uh, philosophy, uh, yeah. logic, and so on, which is still part of philosophy, of course. Yeah. Um, so there's been a, a change in the way these terms are understood and used in discourse. So you're saying it's important we don't confuse them. We don't kind of, uh, you know, push back. We don't read back into uh, the language of Ghazali's day, our modern understandings. We listen yeah. to how he defines the term just to avoid any misunderstandings. Yeah, it's important to avoid anachronism. It, it's very easy to kind of load modern conceptions onto the past, that we have to be very careful of that, particularly when we're going back further in time, uh, a thousand years ago in this case. Um, so he has six main uh, branches that he he unpacks in his treatise, and this is it in his Munqad, in his Deliverance from Error. So mm -hmm. he the first one is the mathematical sciences. This is the study of arithmetic, geometry, and astronomy. Uh, logic, so, you know, the the... The rules of how you come to arrive at certain conclusions. You've got premise, premise, you know, what is inductive proof, what is deductive proof, right? Physical sciences. So these are basically the studies of transformation and change, right? Roughly, roughly what we would call physics, chemistry, and biology in today's time. And then we have the other three metaphysical sciences. So these are to do with, you know, uh, more philosophical matters that we'll, we'll come to see shortly. Political sciences, right? How how do you maintain uh, affairs of the government and the rulers? And then moral sciences, qualities and habits pertaining to the soul. So these are the six branches um, of philosophy uh, that he was engaging with. Now he had, and as we'll come to see, all of these were unproblematic. The only key thing that he had an issue with was number four. And not to say that all metaphysics was bad, but specifically, he was engaging with the metaphysical principles 
of Muslim philosophers. Namely, mm. this is Ibn Sina, the Hafid al philosopher right? The incoherence of the philosophers, the book that Paul showed earlier. And yeah, there you go, he's showing right now. Exactly. That is yeah. a deconstructive book in the sense that that is trying to deconstruct Ibn Sina's narrative. And it does so on 20 points, 17 of which take one takes one outside mainstream Sunni Islam, and three of which take uh, outside of Islam altogether, i.e. leading to kufr, right? So what are those 20 propositions? That is not the, that is not the air of interest for today's presentation. But I just thought I should highlight that, that this book is largely deconstructive in its outlook. Now, this does not mean that he rejected philosophy altogether. As the title goes, he is showing the incoherence of certain philosophers, not philosophy as a subject. That's very important to highlight. And that falls back on what you know what we what some of the um, people we looked at earlier, namely De Grasse and some excellent atheists, who said that you know Ghazali rejected philosophy. He did not. He was he was critiquing certain points that the philosophers espoused, and he did though he did, he did that in a very philosophical fashion in that work. He yeah. develops his own constructive work later down the line in moderation in belief, iqtisad fil i'tiqad. And so you do see here very high level philosophical activity. It's just that that particular book became like a, you know, a scapegoat for some of the anti-Islamic, anti-Ghazali narratives that we, we see out there. I, I do wonder if these uh, anti-Ghazali people actually read Ghazali because uh, it's impossible to come to the conclusions they do just by reading him. So uh, it's almost like a, you know, a meme, that a virus that's gone around that people are believing this about him. But it's not based on reality at all. Uh, um, so uh, it's a bit of a mystery to me why this idea has been circulating. But hey. I, so I'm of the same opinion. I don't think they've actually ever read that work. If they had, so I don't think they would have ever dared to espouse what they're saying. Because mm. it's so far removed from reality that it shocks the mind that you know they, they, can, they can say such things. So I'm, yeah. I, 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 I don't think they've actually read the book. I don't think no. they've read it. So now, um, to make it clear to everyone... What is of interest to us out of these six branches of philosophy are not the last three. I just wanted to clarify, you know, the metaphysical sciences that, you know, he's just looking at very particular doctrines of the philosophical school of Ibn Sina. But our area of interest are the first three, mathematical sciences, logic, and the physical sciences. And it's these three that I will focus on. So let us start with the mathematical sciences. So the first thing it needs to be made clear is that he had concerns about how people in his time, were viewing the mathematical sciences, right? And the first concern is that when you look at, you know, the philosophers, people like Aristotle and Plato and their Muslim manifestations, Ibn Sina, uh, what he thinks is a confusion is when the, the standard of mathematics is applied onto their standard of metaphysics. When you're doing metaphysics, you know, you're, you're relying upon conclusions and premises. And sometimes, you know, you have shaky foundations, sometimes you have very robust foundations. But it's not the same all the way through. And that's why you have areas of differences in these philosophical and theological discussions. What people make the mistake of is assuming that the mathematical standard, sorry, uh, the, the metaphysical standard is the same as the mathematical standard, and that these things are logically working through with absolute certainty. So this is a quote that he has. We have transmitted this story to let it be known that there is neither firm foundation nor perfection in the doctrine they, i.e. philosophers, hold, that they judge in terms of supposition and surmise without verification or certainty, that they use the appearance of their mathematical and logical sciences as evidential proof for the truth of their metaphysical sciences. Had their metaphysical, metaphysical science has been as perfect in demonstration, i.e., you know, proof, free from conjecture as their mathematical, they would have not disagreed among themselves regarding just as they have not disagreed in their mathematical sciences. So clearly illustrating that, you know, just because these people have ma mastered mathematical sciences, it doesn't mean that their metaphysics are on the same level. Metaphysics mm. is always going to be based on certain axioms. And as a result, you may or may not disagree. But to say that this falls onto the same level of certainty as mathematics is, is problematic. Yeah, so that's and, the reason, and the reason being because these philosophers all disagree with each other. Therefore, yes. they didn't have the, the axiomatic certainty, the logical compellingness of mathematics. Uh, yeah. If it did, their metaphysics, then they would all be unanimous and they're not. So he's clearly saying, look, you can just see by their fruits, they're not yeah. resting on that mathematical, axiomatic, logical basis, despite their claim to do so. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. So that's his first concern with math. 
The second concern is how some people, because so the context of the time is slightly different as, as it is now. Mathematical sciences were, you know, very closely associated with the philosophers. And there's a well-known tension between Muslim theologians and Muslim philosophers. And that's why uh, mathematics was sometimes seen perhaps potentially as a negative tool of sorts. And this is where his second concern comes from. He says, the second evil likely to follow from the study of the mathematical sciences derives from the case of an ignorant friend of Islam who supposes that our religion must be championed by the rejection of every science ascribed to the philosophers, which echoes what I said earlier. So he rejects all their sciences, claiming that they display ignorance and folly in them all. He even denies their statements about the eclipses of the sun and the moon and asserts their views are contrary to the revealed law, i.e. Sharia. When such an assertion reaches the ears of someone who knows those things through apodictic demonstration, i.e. very clear, robust demonstration, he does not doubt the validity of his proof, but rather believes that Islam is built on ignorance and the denial of apodictic demonstration. So he becomes all the more enamored of philosophy and venom against Islam. Great indeed is the crime against religion committed by anyone who supposes that Islam is to be championed by the denial of these mathematical sciences. For the revealed law nowhere undertakes to deny or affirm these sciences and the latter nowhere addresses themselves to religious matters. I mean, he is as clear as he can be here that, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I, I was reading this. I was just struck, um, but just introducing a slightly tangential point here um, of the thought of uh, Augustine of Hippo. I mean, he died in 430 um, AD. He is often seen as the, the Christian counterpart of Al-Ghazali. You know, Al-Ghazali, Islam has the Al-Ghazali. Uh, the Western Catholic tradition has... Augustine, you know, the equal titans, intellectual titans. The reason I mentioned St. Augustine, though, is because he made, if I remember rightly, exactly the same point uh, to um, these ignorant um, friends of Christianity, to borrow the terminology here, who argued against um, uh, verified scientific observations, even in his day, in Augustine's day in the fifth century, um, uh, about, say, the planetary system or the earth and so on. And he had this, exactly the same response. And it's fascinating how these parallel insights from the great titans of Islam and Christianity in their respective traditions uh, reach the same conclusions uh, in the way. So I, I just mentioned that it's, it's stunning how Augustine came to the same conclusion yeah. as uh, uh, completely independently of Mal Ghazali, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the, so sometimes people draw a parallel between him and uh, uh, Ghazali. Other times I see Aquinas and Ghazali. And I think yes. he's kind of a, a nice uh, mix of the two. At least I feel. I feel that he's... No, he's absolutely. You know, I mean, I mean on, on this specific point about how people view science and they miss, the way they misunderstand and abuse science and bring the religion into disrepute. This was Augustine's concern. Yeah by people ignorantly attacking science of its day. And this has a very contemporary ring, and this is a different subject, of course, where people just reject wholesale, uh, you know, perhaps arguing the earth is flat, for example. And there, there's some very sincere and nice people I know who actually do argue this, um, and that's a different subject. But, you know, obviously it goes against science. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so we move on to physical sciences, right? So equally, Ghazali felt that, you know, these don't harm religion in any shape or form. So he says, the physical sciences are a study of the world of the heavens and their stars and of the sublunar world's simple bodies such as water, air, earth, and fire and composite bodies such as animals, plants, and minerals. So we have to keep in mind that, uh, you know, this is largely Aristotelian science. So this is, this is a very historically yeah. uh, contextual setting of what he's trying to define here. They also study the causes of their changing and being transformed and being mixed. That is like medicine study of the human body and its principal and subsidiary organs and the causes of the alteration of the mixtures of its humors. Again, a very uh, Aristotelian artifact, right? Very, very, so, uh, very medieval language. This is a language they use in the Christian yeah, Europe as well, yeah. about the humors of the body and so on. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And mm -hmm. just as religion does not require the repudiation, the repudiation of the science of medicine, so also it does not require the repudiation of the science of physics. Oh, that's a key quote there. In red, you've got hi highlighted. How incompatible that statement is with... Uh, the atheist you quoted earlier on, who, who claimed the opposite for Al Ghazali, and yet here he is saying what he just said. Amazing. Yeah, yeah, and so that's why that's why I'm I'm saying anyone who gives a fair reading to Ghazali's works, uh, I I don't think they can arrive at those conclusions. I think it just does not make sense unless they've read it from misinformed sources, 
uh, or Islamophobic sources. Um, mm -hmm. So that's that's yeah, it's just, it's just worrying. And so he has he even has a a, a point of concern of, of of strongly linking physical sciences to the validity of religion. He mm -hmm. says the greatest thing in which the atheist. So I want to be, be uh, you know, I want to mention a point here. Atheists should be tr rendered here cautiously. So this is, uh, I would say, McCarthy. I, I forgot who translated, but I think it was you know, Marmura's translation. I don't think this quite this exactly renders to modern day atheism. But yeah, let's right. just say, let's just say, you know, active non-believers. Let's just put it that way. I'd say. Right. Yeah. But, yeah. So in which the atheist rejoice is for the defender of religion to declare that these astronomical demonstrations and their like are contrary to religion. Thus, the atheist path for refuting religion becomes easy if the likes of the above, above, above argument for defending religion are rendered a condition for its truth. Oh, Augustine said exactly the same. I remember reading this year, it's exactly the same thing. It discredits the religion. If you attack science like that from an ignorant basis, it backfires badly. Uh, it's extraordinary. Yeah, yeah. So Ghazali is you know, as clear as he can be. Yep. And, and and he also wanted to to make make it clear that you know there are some sciences like astrology which he was very cautious of right believe it or not he was very cautious of astrology even though in 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 that period astrology astronomy did not have like clear divisions per se no. but he wanted to highlight that uh, we have to be careful in causal ascription what I mean by that is that yeah of course you can do science you can study the world around you. But just make sure you don't confuse of what you're studying for who's causing it. So he says, it is detrimental for most people. For if they're taught that phenomenal events occur as a result associated with the movements of the stars, it would occur to them that the stars were the ultimate causes behind the events. And that they were divine entities dictating worldly affairs because they're sublime heavenly substances. So again, this is, this is, this is part and parcel of the context of the day. The basic point regarding all of them is for you to know that nature is totally subject to God most high. It does not act of itself, but is used as an instrument by its creator. The sun, moon, stars, and the elements are subject to God's command. None of them affects any act by and of itself. So this is basically Ghazali articulating his occasionalistic outlook. I mean, that's a great paradigm for, I mean, uh, uh, as I've already mentioned in your book, um, Islam and Evolution, which you call Al-Ghazali and the Modern Evolutionary Paradigm. Um, this is something you explore in more detail in that book. Yeah. So it, it makes it, I mean, for me, these quotes make it very clear that Ghazali is just trying to, you know, show people, you know, you can study the world. Just make sure you don't, you don't fall into the trap of that these are things in of themselves. These are mm. all still created entities. And all of these are under the power of God, and He's the one that's sustaining them and maintaining them. And I think that's 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 a, that's a you know that's a very basic axiom in Islamic thought that everything is under God's power, everything. And that's what He's trying to articulate. So again, so not undermining science, but just showing you the correct metaphysics that's supposed to undergird these ideas. Uh, finally, we move on to logic, and uh, there's a lot that can be said about logic, but I want to keep this part short. So again, uh, logic was a discipline that was mastered by you know, philosophers. And he makes it very clear in his works that logic is not something that they have a monopoly on. He says, yes, when they philosophers say that the logical sciences must be mastered, this is true. Meaning he affirms that logic is a science that must be mastered. But logic is not confined to them. But when one seeking to be clever who is weak hears the name logic, he thinks it an unfamiliar art, unknown to theologians, not only to the philosophers. So this falls back onto the contextual baggage of, of how things were wrapped up with the philosophical discourse. So that any close uh, association with philosophy immediately raised some red flags. And it is for this reason, you know, that Ghazali took their ideas and, and even started writing treatises on logic and thus paved the way for logic being embedded in madrasas in seminary systems. And so these are just, you know, a handful of, of, of treatises that he wrote. The most, I'd say, I'd say the most impactful one would be the last one. That's his Usul al-Fiqh book, Al-Mustasfa min Ilm al-Usul. So that's, that's, what you, that's what is used for teaching, you know, principles of legal theory where you see his logic being applied in action. But Ghazali was clearly highlighting, simplifying, and making relevant logic as a form of study. 
And there's a very, very good thesis, a PhD dissertation that was um, uh, written by a student at the University of Edinburgh. This is from 1981. Uh, and it talks about Ghazali's views on logic, how he approached logic, how he wrote about logic, and the uh, the aftermath of that of that write up, in the sense that it led to a positive development in the Muslim world. So all of these, when put together, I think it makes it crystal clear that Ghazali could not have been anti-philosophical, could not have been anti you know natural sciences or anti science, uh, and anti reason. I think that these these are very very misinformed statements made by you know individuals who have no I think intimacy with Ghazali's works, and the I think that the most important point is the next one. When you read Ghazali's works, you know in toto when you when you try to you know stitch all these ideas together, he in fact I think articulates that these are necessary sciences because it forms part of his broader narrative. Now I'll first. Um, uh, Repeat what he says here, then I'll explain what, what he's trying to highlight. So communal obligations include every form of knowledge. So fard kifaya. So we have we have two kinds of obligations: individual obligations in Islamic thought, as well as communal, right? So individual mm -hmm. obligation is what each and every Muslim needs to know: how to pray, how to give zakat, how to fast, etc. Then there are communal obligations. So because Muslims, you know, live in society, they live in a civilization, there are going to be certain activities that at least one person needs to do. Uh, to contribute to the welfare of that community mm -hmm. Otherwise which the whole community might be in sin So this is a well-known thing in Islamic thought yeah. So he says communal obligations include every form of knowledge That is indispensable to the establishment of the affairs of this world And includes disciplines as such as medicine Which is necessary for the preservation of healthy bodies And mathematics which is necessary for financial transactions and the vision of wealth in which wills and inheritance and other needs are involved. Should a region be without someone who practice these disciplines, the people of that region will fall into straitened circumstances. But should there be at least one individual established in that discipline, it would suffice and the obligatory nature of having someone knowledgeable in that discipline would be lifted from the remainder of that community. Mm. Now this is this is a key statement. Why? Because it shows that Islamic thought does push for having disciplines in place that promote the welfare of society. And it doesn't just stop there. His overall goal is what are the necessary and sufficient conditions we need collectively to allow people as best of a chance to reach spiritual ascension. This is a part of his broader matrix in getting divine reception from God. Now, if people live in a very miserable society when there's no water, there's no healthcare, there's no engineering, people are going to be worried about, you know, basic day-to-day -day food, day-to-day -day health problems. If those basic necessities are not there, how can they focus on religion, right? That's his concern. And so he's trying to show that Islamic thought caters for all of this. And it's linked to his broader goal of helping people as best as we can in making sure they have an attempt or are actively seeking to get closer to God. And you can see here that Islamic thought is actually very friendly to the you know, philosophical sciences and natural sciences. They're not anti-philosophical. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Islamic framework is not anti-philosophical. It's not anti-science. And only if you have a very disingenuous motive will you reach that conclusion. But Ghazali clearly does not have that in any shape or form. And I think that's why it's important to highlight that you must go to the sources and where they quote these people because I've, I've noticed that they either they don't quote Ghazali directly from his works. Yeah, exactly. If they do, it's very, very caricature. It's not a clear representation of what they're articulating. Yeah. So that is, uh, you know, my presentation. And I'll conclude there that Ghazali clearly did not shun the natural sciences and philosophy. And this narrative is based on an Orientalist narrative that has reinvigorated itself in various forms, be it in the form of Islamophobia, New Atheism, ex-Muslim Atheism, and even misinformed statements by Muslims, be it part of you know, nationalistic agendas, you know, being anti-traditional, because there are some you know, people like that who are very anti-traditional. They don't want the, you know, Islamic tradition to, to mm -hmm. gain any oxygen because we are now living in a modern day and age. We have to come up with a new mm -hmm. apparatus. All of those circles, I think, are highly misinformed about Ghazali. And I hope that this presentation provides some avenue 
in clarifying those misconceptions. Mm -hmm. These are some, you know, references that I think are key uh, that I, I think people can look into. The, the one on the left is Ghazali's Philosophical Theology by Frank Griffel. Uh, he's, he's, he's a professor at Harvard, I think, of Islamic studies. He's, he's, uh, he's I, I, a, yeah, go ahead. So uh, this, is a, this is a really important work. Uh, um, it's highly regarded as a classic um, as a, by this Harvard professor. So it's a very good choice, I think. Very good book uh, by Frank Griffel. And the one on the right uh, is, is a more recent work by Massimo Campanini. And these two, I think, are excellent in clarifying his mis you know, misconceptions surrounding Ghazali, but also showing how deep of a thinker he actually was. Yeah. And so with that said, uh, you know, thank you very much for listening to me. Feel free to reach out to me uh, if you have any questions. But I hope that that was that. If That's I your email address, of course. Um, yes, that is my email address. Uh, very brave of you to put it up, but uh, um, it's very good of you to uh, put it up so people can email you directly. Um, and I'll link, obviously, in the description below to uh, some of the items and articles that you've uh, mentioned, uh, particularly your uh, chapter on um, uh, atheism that you contributed to the Cambridge University Press volume, um, which I've read, and that's very good as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Paul. So there we go. So um, you mentioned at the beginning that there's a second... Um, part perhaps to uh, your discourse um, which we're going to look at on, on another occasion uh, to do with the the the, the real decline um, in the Muslim world and certain forms of knowledge but this is attributable to very different factors external factors in fact that um, intruded into the Muslim world um, yeah so in this presentation I am simply addressing the first thesis which is the banishment thesis and mm. I and I've tried to illustrate that Ghazali could not have censured philosophy or the natural sciences mm -hmm. uh, by you know, quoting him directly from his works. Mm -hmm. Now, the second thesis is the decline thesis, which is the idea that the Muslim world went through some kind of regress. Mm -hmm. Now, the banishment thesis on its own may, should make it very clear that Ghazali himself and his ideas could not have contributed towards that since he was never anti-philosophical or anti-science to begin with. Now, what is the decline? What are the factors that played a part into that? I was thinking of doing maybe a second part to this presentation yeah, yeah. that can hopefully provide a more holistic narrative, one of the man himself and one of the, the, the thorny question of decline. Mm. No, that's fair. Well, that's excellent. Um, thank you very much uh, indeed, Dr. Shrey Ahmed Malik. Uh, that's a very concise, thorough, and uh, I think com utterly compelling uh, presentation of the truth about Al Ghazali's uh, views, his uh, outlook on science and mathematics and logic and so on, um, and a much needed corrective at this time. So I'm very much looking forward, inshallah, for you to coming back and doing part two, um, a very different story, uh, and in some ways a much sadder story, really, um, yeah. about uh, what happened to the Muslim world um, in due course. So uh, thank you very much for that. Until next time. Inshallah. Thank you, Paul, for having me. See you then. Inshallah.